Well, I think this is where it starts, right? Can everybody uh, take their seat, please? That means everybody. This is 30 seconds. If I had a gavel, I'd be hitting the gavel into order now. <laughs> so come on. We still have a lot of people to testify. Thanks for your cooperation. Um, our next person to testify is probably somebody who doesn't need an introduction on this issue, and that is Josh Fox, who all, you all know um, did the documentary Gaslight. Ga I, I knew I would say that wrong. Gasland. Oh, the Gaslight is a great movie also. Gasland, which has been nominated uh, for many awards and an Emmy, I think. Uh, correct? Yeah. Um, we, we certainly would not be at this stage if it wasn't for you. So I turn it over to you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Senator Avella. I, I, I am so appreciative of, of you doing this, um, bringing attention to the DEC's collusion with the gas industry. Um, I think is one of the most important things that could happen. And of course, I am very, very honored to be here. I always appreciate the hearings where I can testify rather than be led away in handcuffs. Um, so that's well, if a treat. If that ever happens, and we're probably going to go out together in handcuffs. <laughs> it's nice to have a um, <clears throat> little bit of uh, film screening also here. So I wanted to show an excerpt from The Sky is Pink, which is, uh, I'm terming it an emergency short film to deal with the situation in New York State. Um, as you know, Governor Cuomo has said I, uh, he wants to um, have science, not emotion, guide his decision on hydrofracking. So I um, recently had been given a number of documents from the gas industry themselves, their own science, science that they conducted over a period of decades, which shows that they know very well that their wells are leaking and that they have catastrophic rates of well failure. So um, the quote from The Sky is Pink, I think we'll hear why it's called The Sky is Pink in a second from uh, Councilman from Pittsburgh, Doug Shields. And I think I'll just let it roll for about four minutes and then go into the, uh, uh, specifically the, the documents that I want to present. It says otherwise. In the 50s, Hill and Knowlton PR firm designed the strategy to dispel that nasty little rumor that tobacco caused lung cancer, misinformation, and supporting bogus science that would call into doubt the legitimate science. The American Natural Gas Association hired Hill and Knowlton in 2009 as their PR firm. All of a sudden, ads were everywhere. They even bought my name. Naomi Oreskes, author of the book Merchants of Doubt, traced disinformation campaigns from big tobacco all the way up to climate change. When I opened your book, I saw Hillen Knowlton is the author of this oh. strategy for tobacco, and Hillen Knowlton was hired by the American Natural Gas Association. Oh, so there it is. So 60 years later, right, we have the same PR firm that actually invented. John Hill was the originator of this whole strategy. So there they are still doing the same thing again 50, 60 years later. Wow. It's, wow. <laughs> it's depressing, isn't it? <laughs> if we say, you know, oh, yes, oil and gas come out of people's taps naturally, you know, a lot of people just don't know. They think, oh, really? Is that true? You know? Oh, well, I have heard people, I've had heard people say that in Santa Barbara the tap water smells bad, you know? So may, maybe it's true. Okay, now we have a debate, right? An ordinary person who doesn't know what to think doesn't need to think that I'm right. 
they just need to think that there's a debate, because so long as there's a debate, then there's an argument for staving off regulation. Science that really shows that these claims that you're talking about are preposterous. I mean, how do we know that climate change is real? How do we know that tobacco kills people? How do we know that acid rain is caused by burning coal in power plants in the Midwest? How do we know that oil and gas doesn't normally come out of your tap? Well, the answer is we know through scientific studies and scientific understanding. It's just like the tobacco industry had memos in their drawers that said all along that they knew that nicotine was addictive and tobacco was harmful. The gas industry has memos in their drawers. We have some of them. Some of them, in fact, have been published. Others fell off the back of a truck, but here they are. And they'll show you how they've been trying to solve it for decades and how they have no way of completely fixing or preventing the problem. Number one, from Southwestern Energy, the diagram clearly shows that the gas well has a cement barrier around the sides of it that prevents gas from lower layers migrating upwards into aquifers. This isn't a PowerPoint about drilling wells. This is a PowerPoint about how casings fail and allow gas and other substances to migrate into aquifers. It's one of their own documents about how cement fails. Number two comes from Schlumberger, oil field review published in 2003 that showed that sustained casing pressure, i.e. casing failure, occurs at alarming rates. Their own documents showed that well casings failed in 6% of wells drilled immediately upon drilling, and that those well casings deteriorated over time, that over a 30-year period, 50% of well casings failed. Number three, this report shows gas migration at astronomical rates in deviated or horizontal wells. Number four, the surface casing, the casing around the groundwater, doesn't help the problem at all. Number five, this report leaked out of a gas industry conference from Archer, a well services company, shows enormous rates of leakage in the Gulf of Mexico and the North Sea and high rates of what they call uncontrolled discharge. Recent Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection statistics back up Schlumberger's initial findings. Well leakage was between 6.2 and 7.2 percent for newly installed wells, gas migrating into aquifers. So does anybody want to guess how long a gas well has to last? Not to produce gas, but to do its other function of protecting the groundwater from underground sources of chemicals and gas that could migrate. I'll give you a hint. It begins with an F. Forever. These well casings and these gas wells have to last forever, or else they pose an immediate and constant risk to groundwater. So what about Mike Markham? Let's go a little bit further into that. Well, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So... And if you haven't seen the whole thing, you can watch it. It's, there's, it's free, it's up online, it's at the, on the internet, pinkskyny.com. I, I made this film because I wanted to draw attention to two, two aspects of this. Um, well, probably more than two, but chiefly two. One is that not only does the gas industry know full well that their wells are leaking, and that the phenomenon of flammable water or of chemicals in water can be traced back to um, at least in some instances, right, their cement casing problem. And I brought, I brought these, the documents that are featured in the film to you um, with a sort of request. Um, here you can see the Southwestern Energy uh, PowerPoint, which shows the leaking through the casing, some of the uh, statistics from Archer. And this, this report from Schlumberger, and Schlumberger, as you probably know, is the number one fracking company in the world. Um, and uh, this chart on page two of why cement, uh, why, why uh, gas wells leak, um, that shows this unbelievable rate of failure, six percent immediately upon drilling, and then fifty percent over a thirty-year period. That means that in a single generation, half of the gas wells will fail, and that you're talking about rampant contamination, both the gas migrating and the potential for other substances migrating as well into aquifers. So what you're doing here, and the gas industry doesn't like you know, to admit these kinds of things because their priorities are not about protecting people or water, um, is you're trading water and the long-term health of the area for their profits, essentially, is what's happening. And as we know, we're at a surplus of uh, gas in the United States right now. It's gas very low. So there are a series of pipelines that are being proposed going across New York State to connect to liquefied natural gas ports along the coast to export that gas to Europe where it's more uh, it gets a higher price. So we're turning New York into what would be a developing world model of ex exploitive, uh, ec an exploitive economy. Um, that 
part of it is just the very simple science behind this. And when I made the film Gasland, I think perhaps I was kind of naive in terms of the way of presenting this, that the, the presenting this information would provoke a change. <laughs> that pre just simply presenting this in a way that was, uh, that had some degree of popularity in the mainstream would actually provoke a, a reaction of sanity on behalf of both our government and maybe even perhaps the gas industry. Because they did have a choice to come out and say, oh, well, you know what? We're going to work on this. Um, we're going to be good citizens. We're going to uh, protect people. We don't have to assume that the gas industry's response would be automatic denial and obfuscation. But what they have done has gone so far beyond that, which is to try to influence governments, which is to spend millions upon millions of dollars on ad buys. I think, you know, people who have a television know um, that they w when they watch MSNBC, they see the Energy Tomorrow lady on all the time talking about how great shell fracking is and safe fracking. And if you look at this and you look at the history, you realize that there is no such thing as safe fracking. It's not possible. In the same way that there is no safe cigarette. And in fact, the second part of this that I wanted to talk about was Hill & Knowlton, the PR firm that the gas industry hired to do the very same type of job that they did for 50 years with this tobacco industry, which was to create bogus science, to create doubt, to go out there and influence um, both governments and the media and the scientific and academic community. Um, and it it's almost sounds like a conspiratorial type of wacko idea to, to be pointing this out, but it's actually very easy to see. Um, and I'm, I've prepared here a little bit of a sheet about Hill and Knowlton, uh, showing them touting the shale gas industry, and then scaling back 50 years and showing the same kind of thing uh, for tobacco. And if you'd imagine um, that the DEC was in fact investigating tobacco, and you found out that they were trading emails back and forth with the tobacco industry asking them how much it would cost. This to me is amazing, that we, we're, we're witness to a conversation about costs of the health of New York State, of the long-term health of New York State, and of the water resources. And as we heard from the, the very brave and amazing testimony just previously, actual human costs in terms of public health. Uh, it's astounding to me that this has come to light and that isn't, it isn't a greater degree of controversy in the media. Right now, I have to come to a very simple conclusion, um, which is that this has nothing to do with science. This has to do with force. This has to do with power, and it has to do with force. I read emails between Tom West, Chesapeake's lobbyist, um, and the DEC, provided from the FOIL by Environmental Working Group. And I see that there's a very speedy response. There's like a kind of <laughs> colloquial <laughs> relationship going on there. Like, oh yeah, well let's, you know, it's like, we'll talk about the costs of New York's water being flammable and then we'll have, we'll go play golf or something like that. And it's, and you know, I, I, at the last hearing I brought this up, that every several months, we email Governor Cuomo, the DEC, and Joe Martens with a list of 25 very technical questions, not unlike the kinds of questions that were answered with great speed <laughs> between DEC and um, the gas industry, and we've received no response, none at all. These documents um, were brought to them several times um, by uh, engineers from Cornell, Tony and Graffia in particular, I know, brought them to their attention. And on Susan Arbetter's capital uh, program, uh, Tony was there with somebody from the DEC, and he said, you know, um, well, if these documents are such a big deal, why didn't we hear from you before? And he goes, well, I've been trying to give them to you for four years. So what we're talking about here is influence and force. But if I can't get an email through to Joe Martens, and I can't get one to Governor Cuomo, I'm going to ask if this commission would please try to write one on my behalf. Can, is there any way that you could take this stuff, I'll put it in an email for you, it's all digitized, and just send this to DEC and say, we want to know what your answer is for this unsolvable problem. And I'll just give you a little bit of a hint about what would happen next. The DEC would say, well, we have the strongest well casings um, in uh, our regulations. And then you'll point out in the documents that um, Strength and durability are two different things. You can hold a big weight over your head. If you don't hold it for three seconds, you don't get the gold medal. You know, if you, if you, if strength and durability are two different things. They have no, uh, no stipulations as to durability in these well casings. But as, and they also say, oh, well, we have extra surface casing. 
if you read, as it shows in the film, that surface casing doesn't matter at all because you've got problems with migration that are happening lower than that. Um, and that this is rampant in the case of horizontal wells. So if there's any way possible to take that email and just forward it or something, maybe as a, as a state senator, um, maybe there's enough power and force there that a documentary filmmaker doesn't have. Because what, what this comes down to is, and I think this is a lesson to everybody in this room, and I think you all know full well, um, that this comes down to the, to the power of the people against the power of an industry that doesn't care at all about us. Um, and that the, the really is, it's, it's amazing, like the broken record that's been going on for four years. I remember the first DEC hearings in Loch Sheldrake in 2008. I sat and taped those for eight or nine hours. It was exhausting. I was like, how long is this going to go on for? Well, four years later. Um, my point is that it's, it's time um, to call this uh, and show this for what it is. And the only way, the next best the best way that I can think of to do it is the industry's own documents, their own science, which I have here, and I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy to give them to you, and the questions that relate to that. So that's, that's really the end of my testimony today. Um, and hopefully, because my concern is groundwater, and even as a resident of the Pennsylvania, of Pennsylvania and the Upper Delaware, uh, New York's vote on the, De Upper De on the Delaware River Basin Commission determines the fate of wh where I live. You know, it's not just a question of New York, it's also that whole swath of Pennsylvania and the Upper Delaware. Um, so this pertains particularly to me as a member of a frontline community, but also in terms of 15, 16 million people who depend on that water, um, not just in New York, but downstream. Thank you. Thank you. I was probably going to mention this at the end, but uh, I think your testimony was very apropos. Um, I'm going to challenge the governor to meet with us. Thank you. A and you and some of the experts to actually sit down. Thank you. Now, we, we have to put the governor's feet to the fire. If he says he's going to do this only if the science says, then why isn't he listening to us? And again, this is the single most env important environmental issue this state has faced in a long, long time. The governor can get a little personally involved. Well, let's just talk also about the science. To me, the science. If this is the science, yeah. let the industry address yeah. their own reports. Let them, uh, and, and, you know, what's, uh, it's been brought up a number of times, a number of reports, and I'm waiting confirmation on this, but I'm, I'm understanding that Bradley Field, who is the head of the hydrofracking part of the DEC, is also a climate change denier and has signed climate change denial petitions. Um, is that, that's, that's, yep, it's coming from here. It would be great also to write him a letter about that. So, well, why is it that Joe Martens, um, who is a person who has had a lot of credibility in the environmental community, um, has appointed a climate change denier as the head of uh, hydrofracking review? Let's talk about this in a, I think that what I'm trying to explain here is there is a confrontation that's going on, and it is, it is a confrontation, um, and it may need, uh, that's there. There needs to be a equal force pushing against the the force that they're employing, even though they they couch that force in advertisements and in um, other kinds of. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't seem as forceful as as it is, but that's really what's going on here, in my in my view. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. Yeah, I'll take it. The next panel is Marianne Sullivan and Jeff Zimmerman. Good afternoon, Senator Avella, and I want to thank you and your colleagues very much for convening this forum. My name is Jeff Zimmerman. I'm environmental lawyer, uh, counsel for Damascus Citizens for Sustainability, NYH2O, and Sane Energy Project. 
the issue I wanted to bring up today, Senator Perkins brought up earlier in the opening remarks, is not about the wastes from the process, the fracking itself, the failure of casings, et cetera, all of which are very, very important issues, as you've mentioned or stressed in these hearings. The issue I want to bring up today is about the product. The result of all of this development is the natural gas. And the key issue that I want to focus attention on that no, DEC has not paid any attention to is radon in the natural gas. Now, radon is an inert, noble gas. It doesn't react with anything. It is produced only by the radioactive decay of thorium, radium, and uranium. It cannot be destroyed by burning. It will not chemically react with anything else. The only way you can get rid of it is for it to, to decay by radioactive decay. If that happens when it's inside your body, because the primary route of ingestion of radon gas is by inhalation, if that happens when it's inside your body, then you produce cancer. EPA estimates that 21,000 cancer deaths per year occur across the country from exposure to radon. Radon exposure is the leading cause of lung cancer among non-smokers. Now, the level of radon in all shale gas contains radon to one degree or another. The more organic material that's in the shale, it seems to be the greater concentration of uranium, thorium, and radium, which are the, pro the base pro uh, materials that will produce the radon in the gas. The Marsalis shale happens to be some of the highest organic content shale, the darkest shale, of any of the deposits in the United States. We have very, very few data points. Industry has not provided any information and I stress this, any information about radioactivity levels in the gas to New York State DEC that we're aware of. It's certainly not in the public record. Nor have they provided that information to the consumers of the gas here in New York City. The New York City Council, Environmental Protection Committee, and Public Health Committee know nothing about this. And we've asked the Speaker of the City Council to support us in requesting joint hearings of the City Council Committee on Environmental Protection and the Committee on Public Health to start looking at this issue because here's our analysis of it. And I'm not a health physicist, let me put that to, to rest, but as a physics major undergraduate, I began looking at uranium issues and I've worked on uranium issues my entire 35-year legal career at one point or another in the process. The gas that currently is being consumed in New York City, in, in kitchens and apartments across the city, primarily comes from the Texas-Louisiana Gulf Coast, which is some of the lowest na native radioactivity level gas that we'll find anywhere. When it leaves the wellhead in, in the Gulf Coast, the radioactivity level of radon is about five picocuries to maybe 10 picocuries per liter. Don't worry about the units, just worry about the numbers. It decays with a half-life of somewhat under four days, 3.83 days. So in 3.83 days, half of the level will be there that was there at the beginning. It takes about six to eight days, depending on the particular pipeline route that is followed, for that gas to get from the Gulf Coast to New York City. So in that period of time, you have gone through probably two decay cycles. So the five picocuries start level at the wellhead is now down to around one picocurie. And over this last winter, Sane Energy Project conducted over 300 tests in uh, apartments across the five boroughs. We got about 100 usable results out of those tests. All but 85% of them were below the detection level for the method of detection used which was 0.3 picocuries per liter. A few were uh, one or two picocuries. There was one sample on Staten Island that was four and a half picocuries. Now EPA recommends that you begin mitigation of the radon levels in your dwelling 
when, when you hit two picocuries and urges you to use aggressive mediation or mitigation of, of radon levels when you hit four picocuries. By contrast with the very low levels in the gas that we currently have, the one data point we have from our solid shale activity levels is from the USGS in northeastern Pennsylvania, and that's 150 picocuries per liter at the wellhead. The transit time for that gas, which is dry gas as you've heard today, which means it doesn't need to be processed before it can be consumed, the transit time to New York City is on the order of 12 to 15 hours, not days, hours. So the amount of decay that will occur is minuscule, maybe 10, 15 percent. In other words, when this gas is delivered into the apartments in New York City, we anticipate that radioactivity levels will be about 120 to 130 picocuries per liter. That is an enormous public health risk. Nothing has been done to look at it. Nothing has been done to examine it. That's our concern today. With that, I'll pass it over to my colleague. Wow. <laughs> what a piece of information. Um, I am Marianne Sullivan. I'm a member of the Committee on Energy, Agriculture, and the Environment for the League of Women Voters of New York State. Beth Radow is the head of that committee. She's testified at earlier today. And I wanted to read what we wrote, the League of Women Voters of New York State, to Joe Martins, as you know who he is, at New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And it has to do with the uranium primarily, but let us begin with the beginning. Um, I want to reiterate uh, that on June 27, 2012, the Times Union reported that emails obtained under the Freedom of Information Act by the Environmental Working Group revealed that the Council for DEC provided to Council to the oil and gas industry the exclusive opportunity to preview and comment on regulations for hydraulic fracturing before they were released to the public. According to the chronology provided by EWG on September 26, 2011, two days before the DEC went public with its proposed regulations, Albany-based attorney Chesapeake Energy, Thomas West, wrote DEC regulators to make, quote, one last pitch, unquote, to, quote, reduce or eliminate radionuclide testing, unquote, of fluids that storms could wash away from drilling sites. EWG went on to state that because drilling industry representatives were the only stakeholders to see the draft regulatory language before it was published on September 28th to 11, EWG could not determine whether West's, West's pitch caused the DEC to soften its approach to the issue of radioactive pollution. While the September 28th version of the Stormwater General Permit requires, requires testing for radioactive contaminants, it does not propose penalties for drilling companies whose runoff shows ra radioactivity at a level of, public, of concern for public health, or even specify what level the DEC considers unsafe. On June 2011, the League of Women Voters of New York State sent a letter to the DEC, a copy, um, a copy of which is attached, supplementing its comments to the draft, as Geis submitted on December 20, 2009, to reflect the results of a study reported in, on October 25, 2010, by the University of Buffalo, reporting that researchers found hydraulic fracturing also causes uranium a naturally occurring radionuclide that is naturally trapped inside Marcellus shale to be released, raising additional environmental concerns. According to Assistant Professor Tracy Bank, this research revealed that Marcellus shale naturally traps metals such as uranium at a higher level, at higher levels than usually found naturally but lower than man-made contamination levels. 
Bank and her colleagues address the question of whether drilling and pumping millions of gallons of water is into the underground rocks would force the uranium into the soluble base and mobilize it. They had further investigated whether uranium would show up in grown groundwater. Bank and her colleagues found that uranium and the hydrocarbons, or the natural gas, are in the same physical space. We found they are not just physically, but also chemically bound. This article also notes that when millions of gallons of water used in hydraulic fracturing come back to the surface, it could contain uranium contaminants, potentially polluting streams and other ecosystems and generating hazardous west, waste. Bank went, went on to state, even though at these levels uranium is not a radioactive risk, it is still a toxic, deadly metal. In the Attached Leather League referenced Environmental Conservation Law Article 22 enacted in, in 1983, which prohibits the mining of uranium within the state because it might pose, pose danger. The League asked the DEC to consider before issuance of the SGEIS the apparent inconsistency between the scientific determination that New York has high levels of uranium the natural gas hydrocarbons and uranium are chemically bound, and they express prohibition from the New York legislature against mining of uranium within our state, on the one hand, and New York's potential embrace of high volume hydraulic fracturing on the other. A company drilling for shale gas need not intend to mine for uranium to unearth more than trace amounts or introduce the potential risks addressed by this statute. The League did not receive a direct response to its request for reconciliation of this apparent, apparent inconsistency, nor was it addressed in the redraft ra, draft of the S. Geis. The League renews its request for the DEC to reconcile the still unresolved inconsistency that now extends to regulations that propose no penalties for drilling companies whose runoff shows re radioactive activity at a level of concern for public health instead of affirming the precautionary intent of ECL art Article 22. The League of Women Voters supports transparency in government. This includes equitable treatment of all citizens and lawmaking process, particularly when, as in this instant case, the public health safety and the environmental costs associated with hydraulic fracturing may be at tax, taxpayers' expense. We thank you for your consideration and look forward to your response. We have had no response. Okay, this is for you. These of your testimony, especially yes. Jeff. I gave them to Rebecca. Thanks for your testimony. Again, uh, you brought up a very good, interesting issue as part of this overall uh, problem. Well, and I wasn't aware of the concentrations until you mentioned them. Well, it's an issue that isn't going to go away until right. the radon goes away. And it's not going away any other way than radioactive decay. And if we don't look at this, we're going to see a dramatic change in the lung cancer levels in the city. Now, this, fortunately, this Marsalis gas isn't getting to the city yet. But the pipelines are being constructed now, the interconnections are being now, that are going to, that is going to bring this gas to this marketplace. And because it's the closest marketplace, it, it's going to be natural for this to be expanding in, in, in the, the, the gas supply of the New York City. Mayor Bloomberg wants to replace fuel oil with natural gas in order to reduce asthma in the city. A great idea, but let's not replace it with radioactive natural gas that's <laughs> going to cause lung cancer. Thank you. Thank you.
Next panel will be Bruce Ferguson, Kathy Nolan, and Ellen Weininger. We have uh, three more panels plus six people have requested to speak. So um, we only. Uh, Um, we had till 3 o'clock, and I didn't even realize it was a quarter to 2 now. So we're going to try and move ahead quickly so that we can hear from everybody. <clears throat> yeah. Start. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Senator Avella, for convening this hearing and for your efforts to protect all New Yorkers against hydrofracking in New York State. My name is Ellen Weininger. I am a mother, a lifelong resident of New York, and I am the Educational Outreach Coordinator for Grassroots Environmental Education, a nonprofit environmental health organization uh, with a special interest in children's unique vulnerability to environmental exposures and the links to human health impacts. In response to the governor's public statement that he intends to make his decision on whether to allow hydrofracking in New York based on science and not on politics or emotions, uh, Grassroots compiled the most recent and most important independent peer-reviewed science on various aspects of hydrofracking in the easiest accessible format. Uh, included in the digest are studies that were published after the DEC's public comment period ended and even a study that has yet to be released. Um, there was an emphasis on providing uh, the governor with studies on human health impacts since no review of potential health impacts was conducted by the Department of Health and no health impact assessment was included in the DEC's SGICE. Um, the digest was presented to the governor this past Monday on behalf of a small delegation of medical doctors and scientists who have uh, requested a meeting. And um, the uh, digest, which I have a copy for you here today to submit to you, um, was presented to Mr. Basil Segos, uh, the uh, assistant, New York State Assistant Secretary of Environment. And um, uh, he took a meeting of a few minutes uh, with our executive director and associate director and agreed to a meeting, a one-hour meeting, in the next week or so with uh, several people from uh, the administration to include the uh, delegation of uh, medical experts and uh, scientists who uh, agreed to sign on to this. Um, so. This is a critical moment for New Yorkers, but especially for the generations that will have to live with the results of the decisions we make today. Um, children are uniquely vulnerable, and you, we heard earlier from Elaine Hill uh, how critical uh, that issue is. They have no voice, they do not vote, and they rely on adults to protect them. History should not record in any halls of state government those in power were silent in the face of this single most serious public health threat confronting New York and failed to heed the warnings and pleas from physicians and scientists to protect all of the residents of this state. It's interesting because uh, late last night I received uh, a notice uh, from the New York State DEC that they issued an air quality health advisory for central New York and that advisory uh, indicated that the health advisory is in place due to elevated levels of ozone, according to the National Weather Service. The affected counties include Broome, Shenango, Cortland, Tioga, Shemang, Tompkins, Cayuga, Seneca, Steuben, and Shiler. The health advisory, this is going on to quote them, the health, health advisory means active children and adults and people with breathing problems like asthma should avoid strenuous outdoor activity. Ground level ozone is produced mainly by vehicle and industrial exhaust and is not to be confused with beneficial atmospheric ozone. Hot weather and intense sunlight react with ground level ozone, leading to breathing difficulties outdoors. 
according to this DEC advisory. So why are they not making the connection? Uh, Senator Vela, thank you very much for holding this hearing. My name is Bruce Ferguson. I work with the all-volunteer grassroots organization, Catskill Citizens for Safe Energy. I think two themes have emerged here today. One is that there is a mountain of science showing why we should not go ahead with fracking in New York or anywhere else. It, there's no doubt about this. The science is there. It's being ignored. And a corollary to that is attempts to communicate uh, with the DEC, with Governor Cuomo, are also being ignored. This is being done behind closed doors by very few people who are refusing to look at the abundant evidence in front of them. Uh, all of us in this room, and, and yourself as a leader, have been working very hard to try and get regulations that would either prohibit or regulate fracking. None of us have been successful. Since be fracking became an issue in New York State four years ago, we haven't gotten a single piece of legislation to protect the public. We still have a hazardous waste loophole. There's no funds for a health impact assessment, and we don't have a ban. The inability of the legislature to act in the public interest stands in stark contrast to the treatment the industry received when it was setting the stage for the Marcellus Shale play. Long before the public was aware of it, the industry was preparing to frack New York. In 2005, lobbyists drafted an unfair and perhaps unconstitutional compulsory integration bill that enables the industry to cheaply extract gas belonging to property owners who do not want to lease. The bill was written by lobbyists, delivered to the legislature by the DEC, and unanimously voted out of both the Assembly and the Senate in just three weeks. What does it say about our democracy that industry lobbyists can write a law and get it passed in three weeks, but four years of urgent appeals by tens of thousands of New Yorkers have, haven't produced a single piece of legislation? Something's wrong here. There's plenty of blame to go around. Uh, certainly Governor Cuomo, with all his power and popularity, could have ordered a health impact assessment. He could have signaled to his friends on the Republican side in the Senate who we just benefited with a redistricting plan uh, that suited their purposes. I don't think he wants a Democratic majority in the Senate, frankly. Uh, well, you, you tell you know better than I do. Uh, but uh, I think he likes having the balance split where he's the only man in power. He said he doesn't care what the, he doesn't want the legislature involved in fracking. He made that clear in statements last week. Um, I want to consider the role of one of his henchmen and, uh, and the Division of Mineral Resources and its director, Bradley Field. Mr. Field and his division have been dishonest brokers for the industry every step of the way. They've made misleading statements, concealed pertinent facts, and lied in an unrelenting effort to greenlight high volume fracking in New York. I first encountered Mr. Field in 2008 when I went to Albany to lobby against the well spacing bill that allows the industry to easily amass the large production units necessary for high volume horizontal fracking. At that meeting I expected to meet with assembly members, so I was astonished to find myself in a room dominated by Mr. Field and other officials from his division. I was also astonished to hear DEC staff promote a bill with sweeping environmental implications without any regard for the environment or public safety. Although this bill was actually critical to the industry's plans, the division misleadingly presented it as little more than a technical adjustment that would make it easier for the DEC to do its job. The Marcellus play, we were told, would be, quote, nothing new. Hydrofracking and horizontal fracking had been going on in New York for years. No mention was made of the fact that Marcellus wells would require millions of gallons of fluid, whereas conventional wells utilize between 20 and 80,000 gallons. No mention was made of the fact that slick water fracturing would employ scores of toxic chemicals that had never been used in traditional nitrogen and foam frack operations in the state. In an email sent to a colleague of mine, the division claimed that Marcellus shale fracking operations in New York used, quote, only fresh water, sand, nitrogen, and a diluted soapy solution. These frack fluids do not contain benzene, toluene, or xylene. This was an outright lie. Documents I obtained under FOIL showed that by this time in 2008, the industry was already fracking the Marcellus wells, with vertical wells at that time, with scores of toxic chemicals, 
uh, that were not included in the list above. It, uh, some of these documents also state that BTX concentrations would be supplied directly to the DEC by the suppliers because this was, quote, proprietary information. Now, BTX is, of course, industry shorthand for benzene, toluene, and xylene, the very chemicals the DEC denied were being used in New York State wells. To sell the Marcellus, Mr. Field and the division repeated the industry line that in over one million frack jobs, there had not been one instance of water contamination. As New York's Director of Mineral Resources, Mr. Field knew, or should have known, that EPA first identified water contamination due to fracking as early as 1987. And Mr. Field lied about New York's own drilling safety record. He repeatedly insinuated the state had an unblemished record, and on one occasion, he dismissed an accident that utterly destroyed water supplies for several homes as one where, quote, a, bill got stu a, a, bit, a drill bit got stuck and muddied up a bunch of water wells. Walter Hang subsequently foiled DEC's record and found evidence of more than 270 accidents, including drill rig fires, explosions, toxic spills, and contaminated water supplies. Over the years, the Division of Mineral Resources has continued to carry water for the industry every step of the way. Anyone who read the first draft of the SGIS might have thought it was entirely written by lobbyists, and for all I know, it was. In the revised draft, edited, quote, edited and coordinated by the Division of Mineral Resources was somewhat better, but it still favors industry misinformation over real science. For example, the revised draft ignores the groundbreaking, peer-reviewed, quote, methane and the greenhouse gas footprint of natural gas from shale formations by Howarth and all, uh, et al., and instead relies on outdated and inaccurate information downloaded from the Chesapeake Energy website. I recently had an opportunity to collaborate an article with one of the very founders of environmental movement in New York State, Robert H. Boyle, and I've attached a copy of the article we wrote. Uh, now, I have to say my friend Josh has stolen my thunder here because I was going to conclude with the fact that uh, uh, Mr. Boyle discovered that uh, Mr. Field was a climate change denier who had signed a petition that denied greenhouse gases are a problem and denied the fact that they contribute to global warming. In other words, in the great state of New York, the man charged with controlling the emissions of greenhouse gases from oil and gas wells doesn't think greenhouse gases are a problem. And let me just conclude by saying I hope that you have a majority come the next election and you can hold a hearing and investigate the Division of Mineral Resources. It's a stable that needs to be mucked out. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Kathleen Nolan. I'm a board certified pediatrician. I completed my MD at Yale Medical School along with an MSL, a Master's of Studies in Law from Yale Law School. I completed my residency in pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco, and then completed a Robert Wood Johnson General Academic Pediatric Development Fellowship, again at Yale. As part of my fellowship work, I focused on epidemiology, statistics, and research design. I work as an independent bioethicist and have published numerous articles in peer-reviewed publications and have served as a reviewer and editor for scientific and bioethical publications. I currently serve as the regional director for the High Peaks at the Woodstock office of Catskill Mountain Keeper, an environmental nonprofit focused on preserving the health and environmental richness of the Catskill region. I appreciate the invitation to come here today because the efforts that I and others in the scientific community trying to bring forward this information has not been successful, especially with the Department of Health and with the DEC. I want to address a question. Can horizontal drilling, high volume hydraulic fracturing or fracking be done safely in New York? When I first came to Catskill Mountain Keeper, I believe that the answer to that question might be yes, at least in certain geographic and geological areas. Over time, I have come to a quite different assessment. And recently at Mountain Keeper, we've been reviewing the documents that are compiled, plus others, to try to um, define our reasons for coming to a conclusion that the answer is quite different. So we've been studying, not waiting for a fracking to start, as you asked ask earlier. Instead, we've been studying the processes involved in hydrofracking, the chemicals commonly used and their toxicological profiles, 
the waste and byproducts of fracking and what is necessary to handle such waste properly, the geology of the Marcellus and other methane-rich shell formations in New York State, and a growing body of evidence of adverse health impacts experienced by plants, animals, and humans in areas where drilling activities are already taking place around the country and actually in areas where drilling waste is being uh, handled even when drilling activities are not taking place. I now believe that drilling cannot be done safely in New York, and I think that conducting a credible independent health impacts assessment is one of the most sensible ways for the public and others with decision-making responsibility to come together and carefully evaluate the question of safety before deciding what drilling activities will take place, at any, if any at all. So I appreciate your bill on that um, very much. Preventing exposure to toxic materials is a hallmark of occupational and environmental health. The question about drilling safety can therefore be condensed into a question about the gas industry's ability to contain its toxic chemicals, toxic byproducts, and waste products, and its toxic processes. That the chemicals the industry commonly uses are toxic should be beyond dispute, as many have extremely well-known carcinogenic, mutagenic, neurological, pulmonary, dermatologic, and other harmful and sometimes lethal effects. Fracking's byproducts and waste products are even more dangerous as silica, radiation, and heavy metals are added to the mix, in addition to the methane gas itself, and smog-inducing compounds that are generally released at drilling sites along pipelines and via transport of natural gas. Can these compounds be contained or somehow neutralized? I can find no credible indication that they can, even with the best of available regulations and enforcement. At every stage of the fracking process, pathways for contamination open up, and the primary response from the gas industry to date has been to seek exemption from responsibility before contamination occurs and its resulting illnesses appear. Existing and proposed regulations in New York do not adequately address the following predictable health consequences of horizontal drilling that a thorough and fair health impacts analysis could confirm and begin to quantify and address. First, silicosis, skin and eye irritations, asthma, and cardinary, I'm sorry, cardiopulmonary diseases possibly accompanied by serious cognitive impairments, especially in children and in the elderly, will result from airborne contaminants and air pollution related to site preparation, truck track it, and compressor stations, and all will increase as the intensity of drilling operations increase. Two, vehicular accidents and accidents with heavy equipment will injure and kill workers and other drivers, as well as release toxins into the environment, potentially ruining both adjacent land and waterways. Three, well casings will fail, 6% immediately, and eventually all, and will rarely be detected as having failed, creating pathways for contamination of superficial aquifers and an explosive hazard as we at well pads and nearby homes. Four, wastewater and other drilling waste will be released either intentionally under so-called ben beneficial use permits that allow application of fracking fluids on roadways and fields, or through permits for wastewater handling that authorize release of fracking waste into streams and rivers following inadequate treatment, or unintentionally through leaks, spills, and leaching from containment ponds and landfills. Five. Carcinogenic and mutagenic contaminants from deep sites will migrate through natural and induced faults and fractures and via failed well bore sealant materials, slowly in most cases, into near and distant superficial aquifers and waterways, leading to birth defects, diseases, and death, both immediately and with delayed onset, in plants, microbes, and animals, as well as in humans. Six. Natural and drilling-related earthquake activities will further exacerbate the difficulty of containing the harmful effects of the drilling activities. Seven, use of radiation-rich methane will generate increases in lead poisoning and lung cancer, and methane-induced climate change will cause additional illness, injury, and death. 
eight. Communities will be industrialized, resulting in a range of related illnesses and social and psychological disturbances. And nine, many of the adverse health impacts caused by drilling will be either distant from drilling sites or delayed in onset, or both, making them difficult to diagnose, difficult to quantify, and difficult to prove to be etiologically related to drilling activities, especially in individual cases. So if the gas industry is unwilling or unable to contain its contaminants, what recourse do citizens have in order to protect themselves and their children? Most of those slated to be exposed to these contaminants live in residential or agriculturally zoned areas, chosen as good places to raise crops and bring up children, and often visited by people from around the globe as attractive destinations for travel and recreation. Very rarely will highly industrialized activities of drilling actually take place in areas zoned as commercial or industrial. The targeting of the Marcellus, Utica, and other shale formations for gas development in New York State comes long after the settling of these areas and the subsequent growth of farms, small towns, and large urban centers. If left unprotected, the only recourse for children and families when drilling activities come into such air areas is therefore to move out if moving is possible. Are mitigations available? If so, these would be identified in a carefully conducted health impacts assessment. Unfortunately, the available literature and the documented experience of fracking in other countries and other states suggests to me that some elements of the horizontal drilling process carry with them risks that are unavoidable, at least with currently available technology. If this is the case and the inherent and potential life-threatening dangers of fracking can be known in advance of these activities taking place in New York State, I believe we have a moral imperative to conduct the studies and analysis that will allow us to avoid those dangers, even if that means avoiding the activities altogether. So I again offer you my thanks. I thank all the other presenters as well. And I'd like to uh, comment in relation to Ms. Hill's work that we have also had reported to us at Catskill Mountain Keeper uh, incident uh, reports of birth defects. We have tried to follow up on those um, reports and have found that the official registries, both from the CDC and in New York State, have approximately a five-year lag time in terms of um, actually compiling and reporting the, the birth defects that are occurring. So in addition to everything else that I've reported here, there would be that lag time if we don't change how we're screening and reporting these uh, health findings. Next panel is Brendan Woodruff and David Braun. Oh, yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay. I would just remind everybody we have two more panels plus six individuals, and we have to finish by three. Great. Let's do it. If everybody can be concise. <laughs> and I know you've all waited a long time to testify, too. I appreciate that. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Brendan Woodruff. I'm the hydrofracking campaign organizer for the New York Public Interest Research Group. NYPIRG is New York State's largest nonpartisan student directed research and advocacy organization with an emphasis on environmental preservation, consumer protection, government accountability, transparency in government, and social justice. Our primary focus in nearly 40 years of work has been to ensure that there is an open process to promote the integrity of policy making and decisions so that New Yorkers can have confidence in their government. One of the most pressing issues facing New Yorkers today is the prospect of having high volume horizontal hydrofracturing, better known as fracking, in the state. We believe this controversial natural gas extraction method proposed for the Marcellus Shale and other low permeable gas reservoirs carries a potentially huge public health and environmental price tag that should not be ignored by the state. 
Since the last time I testified before the Senate Democratic Conference in April about our concerns with this drilling method, the following have taken place. A Chesapeake Energy well near Douglas, Wyoming had a blowout and methane leak that led to the evacuation of 67 people. A 30-foot geyser of water and methane shot out of the ground near multiple fracking well pads in Tioga County, Pennsylvania. Drilling muds and lubricants leaked into a creek in Fayette County, Pennsylvania. 4,700 gallons of hydrochloric acid spilled at a fracking site in Leroy Township in Bradford County, Pennsylvania. This is the same town where a Chesapeake energy well suffered a blowout in April of 2011. And most recently, an explosion took place at a well site in Boulevard, Ohio on Monday that led to the death of one. You can see the pattern here. These incidents serve as a reminder that fracking is an inherently dirty, unsafe industrial process. As we know, the Department of Environmental Conservation is in the process of updating its 1992 gas drilling regulations and has received an unprecedented 66,000 comments on the revised draft Supplemental Generic Environmental Impact Statement. However, we believe that this document put forth by DEC did not protect New York's health and environment. It did not fulfill the executive order requirements which called for further environmental review. While we would think the serious flaws of the Eskais itself should be enough to conclude that it should be withdrawn, we were astounded to learn of the recent revelation of emails that demonstrate that DEC gave unequal access to the gas industry while in the process of creating this document. This leads us to lose confidence in the agency's ability to independently and competently review and mitigate all of the negative impacts of fracking as is required by CECRA. We believe it is incumbent upon government to act in an open, fair, and impartial manner when deciding public policy, which is why the unequal access that was granted to the oil and gas industry is especially alarming. While it is not surprising that regulators would have sidebar conversations with a broad spectrum of interested parties, it is highly disconcerting that draft regulations reportedly were shared with and possibly influenced by industry lobbyists when no similar opportunity was provided to members of the general public or environmental preservation, public health, or health care professionals. Therefore, in consideration of the aforementioned, we believe the DEC should rescind the revised draft ESCAIS and not allow fracking to go forward in New York State. State. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify before you today. Um, uh, good afternoon, Senator Vela. Uh, thank you so much for holding this forum. Uh, my, my name is uh, David Braun. I'm the president of United for Action and I'm a lead organizer for the coalition of 100, over 130 organizations, New Yorkers Against Fracking. Um, Thank you very much for uh, hosting this forum, exploring the uh, collusion between the DEC and the gas industry. Uh, these email exchanges uh, uncovered uh, by the FOIL documents uh, from Environmental Working Group, uh, while not terribly surprising, are confirmation of an internal dialogue and cozy relationship between uh, an industry that has time and time again proved itself to be bad actors. Um, and the uh, governor, the I'm sorry, the governmental watchdogs that are charged with looking after the best interests of the citizens and the environment. Uh, contrary to the claims of Governor Cuomo of letting the science lead the decision to permit fracking, we have time and time again heard experts such as the ones who have testified here today and that are represented in the letter referenced by Dr. Steingraber uh, to Governor Cuomo, which is signed by 269 scientists, doctors, uh, and other medical professionals. Um, expressing their concerns that the science is not in support of this practice. In fact, they tell us there is much, very much to be concerned about. Uh, here's a quote from the letter in reference to the Eskais. To the contrary, we the undersigned members of the scientific and medical communities have continuously provided facts, logic, science, and information about fracking throughout the four-year review process. We have shared our research findings, summarized evidence, submitted hundreds of comments, and provided oral and written testimony. The problem is not the lack of scientific discourse. The problem is that the voice of science is not being heard. Again, that's 269 uh, scientists and doctors and other medical professionals speaking. Uh, unfortunately, it seems that the governor and the DEC are not listening to the science. 
Um, and now with these new uh, revelations uh, of collusion, we are getting a small window as to why that is. Uh, and while the governor may not be listening, the people are. My organization represents 10,000 members here uh, in the New York City area. However, there are hundreds of thousands of citizens from a variety of different backgrounds and interests who are expressing serious concerns about the myriad of problems and dangers associated with hydrofracking. Because of the alarm created by these scientists and doctors, advocates, advocates have taken a number of steps to try to keep New York State uh, safe from these dangers. In June, we hosted call days where 5,000 people called Governor Cuomo's office in a single day and asked him to ban fracking. In May, we delivered 200,000 petitions to ban fracking uh, to ban fracking to Governor Cuomo's office. In November of last year, in December of last year, hundreds of people, thousands of people, um, 2,000 in New York City alone, turned out uh, to the DEC hearings to express their opposition to fracking. 67,000 comments were filed in the yes guys, most of them in opposition to fracking or critical of the document. The response? Nothing. Meetings? None. The people, like scientists, are not being heard. So now we have a dilemma. If the scientists are not being heard, and the people are not being heard, who is being heard? In one of the email exchanges between Steve Russo uh, and Tom West, uh, that was uncovered by the Environmental Working Group, uh, Tom West warns Steve Russo about the vocal participation at a hearing for the SPECTA pipeline and tells him to take that into account when moving forward with the DEC hearings. What was West warning Russo about? At the Spectre hearings, where I was present with a good number of other community members, testimony was given by a wide variety of individuals, including a representative from the borough president's office, other elected officials' offices, community members, experts, etc. So what is the problem? Isn't citizen participation what hearings are for? Since when does citizen participation become a disruption? I believe it's probably more of a disruption towards business interests than anything. Um, at that meeting, we had about 300 community members um, all opposed the pipeline. FERC approved it anyway. Uh, based on the information we are hearing today, there are a great number of things to be concerned about. Uh, the Environmental Working Group report calls into question the integrity of the whole process and exposes a major threat to public health. With a process which is proving to be dangerous as fracking is, why are we being asked to weigh in on regulations? Clearly, we should be first asking the question, is fracking safe and should we do it? There is a powerful movement uh, that is following and listening to the science. And not only are we listening, we are also speaking. We are speaking out. We will not be deterred and, attend to in and intend to make sure that the rights of all people to clean water, air, food, and land are respected. We will not abide the ruination of our state. Thank you for holding this forum. Thank you, gentlemen. Next panel is uh, Julia Wash and John Armstrong. Frack action. It's going to be me. It's going to be you. Is this the last panel? Okay. But no, the thing we have to call it. Yeah, I didn't see that. Good, thanks. After uh, John speaks, we'll then have the six people who signed up from the public. Great. Uh, thank you, Senator Vella and the Senate Democratic Committee for holding this important forum and for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is John Armstrong. I am speaking on behalf of Frac Action. We applaud your leadership on this issue and the strong stand that you're taking to protect New Yorkers from the dangerous practices of fracking. I want to go through and tie together some of what we've heard today and where things precariously stand right now in New York. I'll start with where things stand. Residents from the tip of Long Island to Niagara Falls have been very nervous since a plan was floated in the New York Times on June 13th that indicated Governor Cuomo's administration was considering moving forward with fracking soon. The plan indicated an intention to frack primarily in five counties in the southern tier. That notion, however, is nothing but a cynical ploy to open the entire state to drilling. Those five counties would simply be five doorways to frack the rest of the state, including the Utica Shale, which lies underneath the majority of New York. 
there is little, if any, legal justification for limiting drilling to five counties. And the plan floated to do so is likely nothing more than an attempt to limit what is an enormous and growing movement of New Yorkers across the state who are opposed to fracking. We are not fooled. If fracking is allowed anywhere, it will happen wherever there is shale. And the impacts, whether it's contaminated water, toxic air pollution, precipitous drops in property values, economic losses, raid on in New York City, or a host of other catastrophic impacts will be felt by all New Yorkers. Following when that plan came out, a scandal around fracking has come to light. A number of recent revelations, as we've heard many of today, derail the legitimacy of DEC's study of fracking and draft regulations. First, the Environmental Working Group revealed outrageous collusion between the DEC and the gas industry in writing and influencing the draft SGICE and regulations. The gas industry enjoyed exclusive early access to draft fracking regulations and a cozy relationship with top DEC officials. From the emails alone, we can see the result of this. The gas industry weakened regulations and influenced the review. And that's just from the emails, which, as Tom West, chief lobbyist for the gas industry, said, and I quote, the gas industry was very careful what we put in emails. That would in part explain what we know is true, which is that the gas industry had frequent phone calls and meetings with top DEC officials. All of this raises some serious questions, such as how many regulations were weakened because the gas industry objected to them? What science, studies, and entire issues of concern were left out of the study and review of fracking? The DEC defends their collusion with the gas industry by saying that it was to ensure regulations are not overly burdensome. Is the public health and safety of New Yorkers a burden to the DEC? Is following the best science, some of which we've heard about today, a burden to the DEC? On the point of public health, we learned on June 29th in an article from Gannett News reporter John Campbell that the DEC has suppressed public health information about fracking from the governor's hydrofracking advisory panel as well as the public. Two county health organizations, one, the New York State Conference of uh, Environmental Health Directors, and two, the Association of County Health Officials, prepared reports specifically for the advisory panel about the health impacts of fracking. These reports raised significant concerns about the health impacts of fracking and called for an independent, expert-based study of health impacts. The day before the advisory panel was supposed to meet and review these reports, the meeting was abruptly canceled. The DEC cannot get its story straight why the meeting was canceled, and in the same light, the DEC has never given those reports to the panel members or the public. They've been kept secret. We recently learned that Brad Field, the director of DEC's Division of Mineral Resources, which is the lead agency writing the SGICE and fracking regulations, dismisses global warming and the impacts of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases. We'll be very clear, this is an outrageous affront to science and is indicative of the seeming disregard for good science as witnessed in the prevalent dismissal and often outright exclusion of independent science in the SGICE. This brings me to the last point I'll make, which is to highlight what we've heard so much of today. One expert after another today spoke to being turned away and ignored by the DEC. They spoke of the DEC leaving out theirs and other independent research and evidence on fracking's impacts. Whereas the gas industry has had the red carpet rolled out for them by top DEC officials, independent scientists and health professionals have been met only with a locked door. In closing, closing, it's clear that the public can have absolutely no faith in the process, the DEC study, the current SGICE, and proposed regulations. The SGICE must be withdrawn, and New York needs to start over with transparent and independent reviews of environmental, economic, and health studies that accompany any new draft of the SGICE. Thank you very much. Uh, next three individuals, Catherine Skopik, am I pronouncing it right? Very good, thank you. Um, Rebecca Cass Stevens and Diane Pagan. Thank you, Senator Avella. Uh, prefacing, I would like to say that in the interest of uh, sustainability, efficiency, and comfort, the AC has been extremely high in this room and could be turned down <laughs> a few notches, in my humble opinion. Uh, my name is Catherine Skopik, and um, 
I'm chair of the Environmental Task Force of the Congregation of St. Savior within the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine and one of the founding members of Renew New York. Um, and the title of my statement is called Global to Local. Rio Plus 20, the 20th anniversary of the first Earth Summit 1992 took place last month, June, in Rio de Janeiro. This UN global conference with the theme, The Future We Want, emphasized the green economy in the context of sustainable development and poverty eradication. With over 40,000 attendees, more than 100 heads of state, 1,000 plus formal activities including site events, learning seminars, dialogue days, roundtables, exhibitions, displays, and the plenaries, one could not help learn a bit about what is going on in the world regarding the state of the planet. Planet Under Pressure, a global scientific conference held in London this past March, amongst other things, identified nine planetary boundaries. Three of these are either near or at the tipping point. That's one, climate change, two, biodiversity, and three, the nitrogen cycle we know our planet is in trouble. Bill McKibben and James Hansen have identified 350 parts per million CO2 as a number we have to get back down to from our present 394 parts per million to prevent further worsening of the global warming. Maud Barlow in her book, Blue Covenant, and I recommend this book to everyone, identifies the water crisis as significant as global warming and in full force in many sections of the world and looming large for all countries in the near future as the planet is running out of accessible, clean water. Three major cause causes of this are one, pollution of surface water, two, the overextraction and pollution of groundwater, and three, the diversion of natural water systems through dams and pipes. As we have increasingly less and less accessible clean water, the clean water we do have becomes more and more precious. To frack each well in the horizontal natural gas hydraulic fracturing process, thousands of gallons of water are needed. And not just one, but hundreds of well pads are in the offing that would utilize hundreds of thousands of gallons of fresh water. To these thousands of gallons of water, as we've heard today, and as most people here know, sand and hundreds of chemicals are added, most of these carcinogenic. As the shale formations deep below the surface of the earth where the gas is located naturally contain radon, as we've also heard today, the frack water that returns to the surface of the earth not only retains all those chemicals, but is now also radioactive. None of these chemicals or radioactivity can be removed by any treatment system or technology. Where will this toxic frack wastewater be placed? It has been known to be dumped in rivers, placed in holding pits, some of which have over flooded into surrounding agricultural land during storms, used to wet down dirt roads in rural areas, and some has disappeared. Where? It is not known. The industry does not always disclose such information, nor is it tracked by any agency. And by the way, I encourage you and second, third the motion to go ahead with that meeting with Governor Cuomo and Josh and all the experts who are here today because I think it's essential and I applaud you for making that suggestion. And another issue that hasn't been brought up today is that although it doesn't last as long, unburned methane escaping into the atmosphere is anywhere between 25 and 73 times more greenhouse gas producing than a CO2. Scientific empirical evidence from states where fracking has been done shows the health impacts of this process to be disastrous, also as we've heard today, causing immune disruptor diseases, lung disease, cancers, and more. And we've also heard evidence of the 200, over 250 physicians in this state who have called for an impact study before any decision is made. A seismic study has been called for 
as drilling is known to cause earthquakes. An economic impact study for all regions of the state has been called for. And instead of these studies being conducted to protect our people, plants, animals, water, land, air, and ecosystems, the DEC apparently has co-opted the process and joined with the gas industry, as we've also heard. So not only could we lose our clean water, land, air, and health, we are losing our democracy. I and the people I represent call for this corrupted process to be proclaimed null and void and for an independent process to be instituted immediately. As an individual and citizen, I call for a return to our democracy. To the people belongs the decision. Thank you. I'll be very brief. My name is Rebecca Cass Stevens. I'm a retired accountant. I used to practice here in New York City. Um, I live in Binghamton, which is in Broome County, one of the five southern tier counties. And I um, will cut right to it. I am aware that certainly, well, Governor Cuomo said that if some towns or villages say that they are frack friendly, uh, then they would be considered for uh, for this idea that he has. And uh, Binghamton has voted to not allow it in, in Binghamton uh, city limits. Okay, Colesville is to the east of us. A woman I know in Colesville said that she was appalled to find out the next day that a town meeting had been held and that there was a vote taken and they voted to allow to be fracking friendly in Colesville and nobody knew it was happening except a very few people. Also it was rather late in the evening. It was not on the agenda. So that's not, if you hear that there are towns or villages that are friendly to fracking, I would be very skeptical. Certainly in Colesville's case it, it is just not true. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because when I was, as I mentioned at the beginning of the hearing, I was upstate yesterday and there was a local paper saying that the Afton uh, City Council voted to support it. And yet I was talking to people from there and they were like, they didn't know about it either. No, so it may very well be that the powers to be are now going to try and push some last minute votes in these five counties to try and justify. No, not to let know yeah. that it's happening. So right. interrupting. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. Hi, and um, thanks a lot for holding this. Uh, it's really uh, it's in it setting a good example for the governor. Um, my name is Diane Page, and I am a social worker. In uh, I'm from New York City, and I've done social work with uh, very low-income people in New York City, but I also had the opportunity to live in Delaware County last year and be a, a social services caseworker in Delaware County. And, uh, the perspective that I want to bring to all this is that I noticed something in my time at Delaware County working with poor children, which is basically that um, despite despite the poverty, and there is, I would say, a good um, 19,000 residents out of the 45,000 in Delaware County are either very close to the poverty line or, or way below it. Um, I would say that there are certain things that, that poor children have in rural upstate New York that makes it possible for them to, to have to, to meet some kind of standard where their basic needs are met and, that, and they can thrive despite a lot of hardship. One of the things that they have is uh, astounding, pristine natural environments to play in. Um, even the very poor if it, that I went to visit as a caseworker had beautiful, uh, beautiful places to play. They have the capacity to grow their own food because there's beautiful, pristine land around them, as poor as they may be, and, uh, and they also have pristine water. And my concern is just to, to bring it back to that is that I'm, a, I, I'm very concerned for what will happen after fracking, how you remediate that. I kind of see it as 
you know, maybe it, it'll end up being like this thing like from the Titanic. Remember in the Titanic when all the poor people were stuck down and ended up dying and the rich people were able to get out? You know, the if you because I've kind of thought this through to its conclusion and with regard to um, so if you were to ruin the water, right, then it would be incumbent on the state to remediate what the corporations had done. And that means that the social services costs, obligations of the state will go through the roof, not in a way, I mean, I think that the state should increase uh, the things that they provide to lower income communities, but not to remediate a wrong that never had to take place. The, the costs, social services, special education services to remediate the cognitive problems, um, Medicaid to pay for all of the respiratory problems, the cancer, the immunity problems. I, the, the state will be absolutely hobbled by the costs that will come from this. Um, and it's so unnecessary that if we just, if we plan properly. So I just wanted to inject a little bit of what, um, of what I think has to be remembered, which is that in any of this, of course, we'll all suffer, but the people who are going to suffer the most are the kids, and don't take away from uh, the children in rural environments really the only great wealth that they have at this time. And of course, that's not even going into what could happen to the children in New York City. So thank you. Thank you. Last panel, Jessica Roff, is it R-O-F-F? -F? William Houston, Dan Danielle Gerard, and Adele, is it Brenda? Okay. Might as well start. <laughs> I don't even need this. Um, hi, my name is Jessica Roth. You've never seen me before, I know. Um, uh, <laughs> I volunteer with United for Action Food and Water Watch, New Yorkers Against Fracking, and the Brooklyn Food Coalition. I'm a fourth generation Brooklynite uh, and grew up my summers in the Catskills. Um, I actually don't have a whole lot I'm going to add because clearly we've covered quite a lot of material already today. But thank you for this opportunity. Um, anyway, obviously, the DEC collusion with the gas industry is an enormous problem. I'm horrified. I'm sadly not surprised. Um, that is a bigger concern to me that I'm not surprised. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and it's just particularly disturbing given um, what Al Appleton was saying in the Fraconomics event that we held, where he talked about how you know this is an industry that has proven time and time again and been rewarded time and time again that their methodology is lying, cheating, stealing, cutting corners and doing whatever they can to increase their bottom line at the cost of everyone and everything that you know gets in their way. And so it's particularly disturbing that this is the industry that's weighing in on not, not only just any possibility of our future but the possibility of regulating themselves when they're proving that that is an impossibility. Um, uh, clearly, we need a really comprehensive health assessment, health impact, um, which clearly the SGEIS doesn't have. Time and time again, as we've heard from far more knowledgeable and uh, trained people than I, that this is a health, there are health issues that come up over and over again. Um, I was at the big action in Ohio a few weeks back and, you know, met all of these people who have you know, drilling going on in their backyards and, and have waste coming from all the other country, all the other counties and states. And for a long time when I've been testifying, I've been talking sort of almost as a punchline, like can you believe their, the only plan they have is to ship our waste to Ohio? And, and it was a real reality check for me at that time to, to talk to the people who have these walls going in in their backyards and who are sicker and sicker by the day and having more and more problems, you know, and are now chaining themselves to um, well pad areas and there's, you know, uh, I mean, things are really heating up in Ohio. And, uh, you know, and a lot of people are still looking to New York to be some form of shining beacon, which I, you know, 
I can't lose hope that we're going to be, but it's really, really disturbing the, the path that we're taking. I won't. But I do feel like we are heading backwards. You know, as I'm listening to the, to the types of health issues being raised over and over again, the song from Sweet Honey and the Rock keeps coming into my mind about, you know, we bring more than a paycheck to our loved ones and families. We bring asbestosis, silicosis, brown lung, black lung disease, the radiation that hits the children before they even get conceived. And it's just, you know, that song, I heard that song when I was like 10. I'm 41 years old now. <laughs> I'm tired of these issues, you know. We should be moving forward instead of moving backwards. And we're moving backwards, you know, not only in, in, in pushing forward, uh, you know, an allegedly alternative fuel, but that clearly creates all of the same problems as all of the fuels that we're trying to get off of. But in democracy, obviously, because we're allowing, you know, corporations to take our voices away. The people are losing their voice in this government. And we're not going to stop yelling and we're not going to stop talking until we're heard. But it's so frustrating that it's like, you know, I mean, they say insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and trying to get a different result. And, and it, you know, clearly there's, a, you know, a bit of insanity in all of us because we are doing that and we will keep doing it. Um, but the idea of moving forward with a plan that is essentially sending us back to the days of Jim Crow, where we have a separate protection in the expectation that that's okay to treat different people differently. I mean, if you look at our history and the history of the world, clearly that is not productive. So, you know, I just think that we need to, you know, move out of this. Clearly, we can do a health impact assessment regardless of if it started here or not, because we have plenty of other cases. And the whole point of, a health, of an, any kind of, like, environmental impact assessment is to do it before before the problems are actually in your front yard. You would think. So, <laughs> so I think we need to, you know, take back our democracy and our food and our land and our air and get this thing resolved. So, yeah. uh, Thank you, Senator Avella. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask you to take a flight of fancy with me today, and we should uh, pretend that uh, adequate regulations can be drafted, that there's nothing wrong with the revised draft uh, S. Geis, that there was no collusion between the DEC and the gas industry, and that the gas industry are good citizens. So taking all that into account, uh, we already know several things about New York State. One is that the DEC has had its budget cut drastically. It has fewer than 20 people overseeing more than 13,000 conventional wells. It has no staff and no ability to oversee fracking or to enforce any regulations. Number two, the state has no plans to deal with an emergency, least of all, least of all poisoned drinking water, and no plans to provide drinking, bathing, or cooking water to any towns and villages in which such an accident could occur. Number three, there is no requirement by the state that industry have the experience, the finances, the insurance, or the equipment to deal with an emergency. New Yorkers are going to end up footing the bill. We are essentially the insurers. Number four, fracking does not make economic sense. Any alleged economic benefits to landowners, to anybody else, will be wiped out by taxes and fees to support filtration systems and other remedial measures, including addressing all of the health impacts that we've heard about today. So now I'm going to end the fantasy and just say that all the objective data and evidence show that there is no safe way to frack. That's why Three Parks Independent Democrats supports a ban on fracking. I recognize now that I did not introduce myself. I'm Danielle Girard, the president of Three Parks Independent Democrats. We are an Upper West Side political club that has been working uh, for a ban on fracking in New York State for two and a half years now. Uh, and finally, uh, now that our fantasy is over, I also wanted to leave you with another uh, in uh, your series of questions to ask the governor, which is that given the heat we are currently experiencing, the drought around the country, and climate change in general, is fracking really what we want to be doing with millions of gallons of water per well? Thank you, Julie. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Vela and the staff, and I thank you for holding this important hearing. And I th think this fracking is really a slap in the face of nature, and that's just what it is. The fracking also, I wonder if it causes trauma. Does it cause trauma that could affect even the nuclear plant that we have upstate? 
Sure. So this is another issue that I think we should address. I would wish that the nuclear plant wasn't there, but since it is, <laughs> but since, I know, but I'm saying that since it is there, is this, in this fracking, you know, the, the pounding, is it going to have any negative effect on that? I mean, we're going to have enough problems with the fracking and with our water, and once the water has been contaminated, you can't go back. So uh, these are the issues that I am addressing, and I am part of that Chop Liver Brigade, and I'm also a member of the Gray Panthers. Thank you. Thank you. You know, um, in summary, sort of thank everybody that's come to testify today, especially everybody who came from the very beginning. We've been here for five hours. It doesn't seem like that long, actually, at least from my perspective. Um, the battle goes on. You know, when, I, when I was actually in the city council, um, when was it, 2009? 2009, when I introduced a resolution urging the state legislature to ban hydrofracking. I had no idea that it would take my election to the state senate to introduce the legislation in Albany. I have seen the development of a huge grassroots effort all over this state in the past few years. And if anything, and this goes back to what Josh Fox was saying earlier, if anything is going to defeat the money and the oil and natural gas industry, it's you and the people in a real grassroots effort. And I'm, I'm still optimistic that this can be defeated because Governor Cuomo has higher ambitions. And I've said publicly, if the governor allows hydrofracking in this state, he owns it. And then when that first contamination uh, situation occurs, and we all know they will, those presidential ambitions are going to take, you know, are going to go bye-bye. So what we have to do is make sure that the governor finally understands that when we go to the voting booth, this is an issue that we are going to vote on one way or the other. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.